Joining me now is the pastor of Trinity Bible Chapel there in Canada, Jacob Rayom. Jacob, welcome. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. Hey, it's good to have you, brother. And uh, as always, you're no stranger to our podcast. I just wanted to uh, you to inform our listening audience and viewers uh, concerning this C4 bill uh, that has been passed into law. I think it was on January the 7th. Is that right? 2022 that it became it's effective? Sometime, it, it received royal assent just before Christmas, and I think they need 30 days or something before it becomes law. So it would have officially become law within the last week, week and a half. Wow. So for those who don't know what the C-4 bill is that passed unanimously in both the Senate and the House of Commons, what is it? It is a bill that is prohibiting, I, I have it actually before me, and it is a bill that is prohibiting um, helping somebody, I guess, convert from homosexuality to heterosexuality or helping someone convert from transgenderism um, to accept, as they call it, your gender or sex assigned at birth. I mean, we know that sex and gender are designed by God in heaven. So right. it's not like the doctor, you know, walked in and say, oh, I'm assigning a gender, but that's the way they, right? right. That's the way they, um, they, they've worded it. So it, it essentially forbids helping somebody uh, convert to, I guess, a, a normal biblical sexual ethic and view of, of themselves. I think the the most alarming to me part of the bill is actually the preamble. So it's not the bill itself, and the bill itself is terrible, but the preamble of the bill grounds the actual bill um, by alleging that uh, um, there are beliefs that propagate myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, homosexuality. And so essentially it's grounded in the presupposition in the preamble that declares the Bible to be a myth. Yes. And that its teachings are dangerous is worded in the preamble. Let me read that real quick for those listening. It says, whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because among other things, it is based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender, gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions, so on and so forth. So exactly as you say, the myth that basically sexual orientation or sexual identity and gender are together, biological sex. So it's trying to separate those two. Right. It's a myth that that's to be preferred. It's a myth that that being a heterosexual in a monogamous marriage is to be preferred. It's a dangerous myth, myth actually. It's harmful to society, according to our political leaders. Wow. And so for those, this is something that uh, you are very familiar with, but for those who are not familiar, um, religious liberty again in Canada, very different from your cousins to the south of you in the United States, but explain that real quick. Well, we do have a, a constitution and part of our constitution is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter of Rights and Freedoms delineates various rights, including the right to, to assembly or association, religious rights, rights to free expression, and, and so on. But the challenge that we're facing up here is is section one of the charter, first of all, allows the government to restrict rights so long as it can be demonstrably justified in, in a free and democratic society. Um, historically, it's been the onus has been on the government to prove that they, they should be able to restrict these rights for a season. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing the courts, it, it seems to me that the government's actually being given the benefit of the doubt in the restriction mm -hmm. of, of rights. And the court cases over the last few years, it, the, the, the courts have sided with the government. So you might be familiar with, it received international headlines in 2018, there was a ruling on Trinity Western University and Trinity Western University had a lifestyle covenant that bound their students as a Christian university in Western Canada. And they had a lifestyle covenant that bound their students to a Christian sexual ethic. Um, the law society of that province wouldn't let them um, start a law school. They wouldn't credit their law school. They challenged it in the court and the, the court, the Supreme Court of Canada sided with the law society. 
And to me, it, it, if you read the ruling, it's in essence, at, at that point in time, the Supreme Court of Canada basically said that, you know, homosexual lifestyle is, is, is essentially more sacrosanct than the religious beliefs of Trinity Western University. And so you're kind of looking at what's going on right now with this Bill C-4 and you're wondering, okay, which way are the courts going to go on it? And certainly our recent history uh, doesn't give us a lot of clear, uh, happy um, signals. Wow. So here you are in, in, in 2020, in 2021, having to defy already these lockdown orders of, of government uh, in order to meet as a church has always met for 2,000 years, uh, going all the way back to Acts, Peter and John, you know, we must obey God rather than men, uh, and you as, as a church continue to meet, and now you have this. So what's the future look like for, for pastors preaching the gospel, for churches congregating together uh, as they always have in Canada? Well, I think the key is, is the churches, the churches have to be faithful. And uh, the reality is a lot of churches haven't preached against this particular sin in a long time. So I don't expect them to start preaching against it now that the government has passed this terrible law. But for those of us who are attempting to live by faith and obey what the Lord has entrusted to us and commanded us, it's a matter of, of faithfulness and we'll see what the government decides to do. Wow. And so, uh, you know, as you're, as you're looking forward, uh, well, rather than looking forward, but looking back as well, um, here in the United States, one of the things that I've heard over and over again in the sort of broader evangelical culture is this idea that pluralism is a good thing, multiculturalism a good thing. Uh, and yet what we're, what we're seeing as a minority culture becomes a majority culture, say a progressive secular culture, uh, you know, a Darwinian ideological belief system that overcomes the traditional Judeo-Christian ethic and tradition. Um, that becomes the uh, supersedent, or that becomes the uh, perennial cultural hegemony, right, that sort of takes over everything. Does pluralism really exist in that context, or does it, is it just a myth? Right, right. Mark, so Mark Knoll wrote a, a little book called What Happened to Christian Canada? And in the book, he makes the case that Canada was actually a more Christian nation than the United States until about the mid 60s to the mid 70s. And what happened in the mid to late 60s, 1967, is Canada started to officially adopt the multicultural doctrine. Um, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Jeff's father, was elected prime minister in 1967. Uh, he remained prime minister with the exception, I think, of about two years until the early 80s. And under his leadership, we completely shifted from a Christian culture to a multicultural culture. And I've written on this. And I think the, the biggest problem with the multicultural culture is that it declares all cultures equal. So now Christian culture is declared equal with Islamic culture, which is declared equal with homosexual culture, which is declared equal with, you know, you, you just put it in there. It's declared equal. And, and who declares those cultures equal? The state. So now who's God, right? Right. So if, if, if Christian culture is the best culture, which you and I would believe, there's a natural culture that flows from a Christian way of living. That's right. If Christian culture is the, is the best culture, that's a culture that hails Christ as Lord. Mm -hmm. But if the government is now putting all of these cultures on an equal playing field, it is, the, it is the word of the state that is now becoming supreme as opposed to the word of Christ. I think there's many problems with this ideology. We're seeing it come into full fruition in Canada, but if you want to boil it down to the biggest problem, it is the state superseding Jesus Christ and proclaiming their word and their law to be supreme. Yeah, well put. Um, you know, it, it becomes this idea, this basically becomes the perennial orthodoxy, um, and it becomes this sort of absolute moral relativism. Now, that, that seems like an oxymoron, and it should be. But moral rev uh, relativism or cultural relativism becomes the absolute of society. And so there is no standard. As long as you agree with everyone. Yeah. yeah, as long as you agree with every ideology being equal, you're okay. But the minute you start asserting the lordship and supremacy of Jesus Christ over certain things, you're now the outlier, you're now the bigot, and 
Um, as I found out in the last 12 months with all the charges we face for opening our church and asserting Christ's supremacy over the church, you know, you're, you're now in trouble with the law. Yeah. So, so for the, the Christian that might be listening to this or the mildly woke evangelical, uh, the Bible makes it very clear in uh, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. That means you have to proselytize. That means you have to convert. That means you have to confront. So it, it's not assumed that there is this kind of postmodern, relativistic, sort of winsome way of getting everybody to like you. You have to confront people with the gospel, just as you've been confronted. Yeah, and I think it, it, you look at the context of Matthew 28 and the Great Commission. It was written within the context of a Roman society. And so you were quite all right in Rome to have your little, you know, mom and pop religion, so long as you acknowledge the supremacy of Caesar, who by that point believed himself to be God incarnate and himself to be divine. So the government in that case was divine. And how did they show their assertion or assert their own self-perceived divinity? Well, they just broke society up into, and, and every religion is fine. Just don't think your religion is superior to Caesar. And, and so when Christ when Christ said, render under Caesar what is Caesar's and render under God's what is God's, it was actually revolutionary in one sense, because all of a sudden Caesar doesn't have access to something because there's something that belongs to God. Yes. And Caesar had the lesser thing. God had the greater right. thing. I, I absolutely, Pastor. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate uh, you taking a stand for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, standing upon His Word, uh, doing so unapologetically. Um, we're, we're looking for courage. Uh, we need it now more than ever, and your voice matters in this fight. So we really appreciate it, and our prayers are with you. Well, thanks uh, for having me on, Ryan, and keep up the good work. Absolutely. Thank you, brother.